Father in heaven, we echo what the lyrics that we just sang and we say to you, Lord, we need you. We need you as a church. We need you every hour. We need you to come now and use through your spirit to focus our eyes, to open our eyes, to see wonders anew in your scripture. We need you to come now and to, to comfort those who are hurting. We need you to come now and to calm those who are confused and who are burdened. And we need you now to come and to bring your joy of salvation into our hearts. We need you every hour. And Lord, we ask that there will be a remarkable change in our lives, even as we sit here listening to your word, ministering to our souls. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Last week, we've been talking about the spirit and his works. And we mentioned that the primary work of the spirit was to glorify Christ in his people. That was the main work of the Spirit. And therefore, the most spectacular miracle that we can ever witness is for someone to come to Christ, for someone to be brought to Jesus and for that person to believe and to surrender Jesus is the most spectacular miracle we could ever witness. That was one of the first points. Number two, we also saw that the diversity of the gifts of the Spirit reflects the diversity of the Trinity. Because God in His Trinity is rich and diverse, therefore the church reflects that diversity. And also we saw that the gifts were all given for one purpose only, for the common good of the church, to build up the church. That's the only reason these, church, these gifts were given not to make someone better than the other, not to make someone more effective than the other, but for, to make these people effective for the church. And so Paul says in chapter 14, verse 1, he says, you should pursue love and you should earnestly desire the gifts, especially that you may prophecy. Now, why does Paul say that you should especially desire the gift of prophecy? And he gives the reason in verse 3. He says, the one who prophecies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. That's the reason why we ought to seek for gifts, to build up the church. And last week I mentioned something. I said, what we should do when we're searching for spiritual gifts is not go through the list of these gifts and ask ourselves which one of these gifts match or fit us. Since all of these gifts were given to build up the church, we ought rather to look at the church and look at the needs of the church and ask, Spirit, what needs are there in this church that I could fulfill? What gifts can you give me for me to become an integral part of this church? All of the gifts were given to build up the church, and we ought to desire all of the gifts but we are, we are called also to ask for specific gifts to meet the needs of this church. That's why Paul says you should earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. That means that you can ask for spiritual gifts and you ask for them to meet needs. So that was last week. This week we want to look at how these gifts work to build up the body of Christ. How do all these diverse gifts and these diverse peoples come together so that we today, sitting of us, 80-odd people, can be called the body of Christ and can be healthy and working together? So let's read from our passage this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 31. I'll read it and you can listen carefully. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 31. Paul writes, For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. 
If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. But God has so composed the body, sorry, which, ought, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there, be, there, may, there be, may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, then helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Today we're going to talk about the body of Christ and how the body of Christ functions to glorify God in the world. And there's something we need to talk about before we look at this passage today about the body of Christ. I'm glad that the worship team read from, first, uh, from Ephesians this morning because Ephesians 1 tells us something about the body that is, that is really shocking. The body of Christ in Ephesians chapter 1 is actually called the fullness of Christ. Let me read to you what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, And God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him. Who fills all in all. Paul says that the church, the body of Christ, is the fullness of Christ. In other words, there is a sense in which Christ is incomplete without the church. Christ as the head is incomplete without his body. That might sound blasphemous for, to a lot of people, right? Because it might sound like, how could, how could God be incomplete but the Bible tells us that the church is the body of Christ and Christ without his body would be incomplete. That's why Paul says Christ, it, the body is the fullness of Christ. Just as the body is incomplete without the head, so the bride is incomplete without her husband. And that's why the body and Christ are inseparable. You remember when, when Jesus was talking to Saul on the Damascus road? When Saul had not yet become Paul and Saul was walking on the Damascus road, well, he was riding on the Damascus uh, road on his donkey, and Jesus appeared to Saul and he said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That's a peculiar thing to say. Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus. Paul was persecuting the church. And yet Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because the body of Christ is inseparable from the head. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and goats, just to hammer that point in. Jesus said this parable to his disciples near the end of his ministry, and he said to him, Before God will be gathered all the nations, and God will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from goats. Goats. 
and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, he will say, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous on the, will say to, to, to the king, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when, when, when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Then the king will say to those on his left, he will say, Depart from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also, then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then the king will say to them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. If you remember what we were talking about three weeks ago, we mentioned that this is the reason why no one can ever say that I love Christ, but I hate the church. No one can ever say that if they are really a Christian. No one can ever say, I love God, but I can't stand going to church. I'll worship on my own in my room. I'll pray on my own in my room. And you can't do that because the body of Christ is not separated from Christ. If you want to separate the church from Christ, you are essentially cutting Jesus' head off from his body. And you cannot do that. And this is why... We need to understand how to live as Christians who love Jesus, but also as Christians who love the church. And it's not an easy thing to do. You just have to look around in this room, and there are people in this room who you might not like. <laughs> there are people in this room who might get on your nerves, even for me. And I need to learn how to love the body of Christ, because God says, if you love Christ, you must love the body. You cannot separate those two things. So we need to learn how to do that. And we're going to build towards chapter 13 next week. We're going to build toward the ultimate goal of all of this, which is to learn how to love one another. But here today, Paul is going to talk about how the body of Christ functions and what the body of Christ was meant to be so that we can love one another. So there are two things in this passage today that I want to point you to about the body of Christ and what it is. Number one, the body of Christ is an impossible community made possible by the Spirit. Number one, the body of Christ is an impossible community that is made possible by the Spirit. Verse 12 and 13, Paul writes, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For, one, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Jews, Greeks, slaves, free. And God says, this is the body of Christ. But this should really shock you because these four terms, Greeks, Jews, slaves, and free, those terms go against the very term and very meaning of the word community. The word community means common things that bring about unity. That's what community means, common things that bring about unity. And there is nothing common about Jews and Greeks. And there is nothing common about slaves and free. It's simply unthinkable for first century Christians to have Jews and Greeks meet together in one room. 
It's unthinkable for a Jew to do that because Jews are defined by God's law. They're defined by God's covenant. They're defined by the promises that God gave to these people. And they did not associate with themselves with Greeks and with Gentiles because those people were unclean. And Greeks were the same. Greeks looked down on the Jews. They were the ones who had conquered the Jews. In fact, as we're reading this passage, as this passage was being written, the Romans had taken over control of the Jews and Jerusalem and Israel. So the Jews looked down, the, the, the Gentiles and the Greeks and the Romans, they looked down on the Jews because they were weak people who had been conquered by the Romans and they did not associate themselves with the Jews. So this was an impossible community to have Jews and the Greeks come together. You know, the modern equivalent of this would be for Jews and Arabs in the Middle East to be in one church and to meet together and to eat together and to share their lives together. This is just unthinkable. Thousands of dollars and millions of people are thinking right now how these two peoples can be reconciliated so that there would be no more wars in the Middle East. And yet Paul says they can become a new community in Christ. This is something incredible. This requires a miracle. When Paul says the slaves and the free can get together, this is just another way of saying that these are two impossible groups that have to come together to become the body of Christ. The modern equivalent of that would be the homeless people and the people who are, quote, regular people. Just imagine if our church was built up of equal parts homeless and equal parts regular people. That's unthinkable for so many of us. But Paul says that this is the body of Christ. In the first century, the slaves and the free people, they did not associate with each other. They didn't eat with each other. They didn't do life together. Even nowadays, slaves and free people don't live together. They don't eat together. When I was in Taiwan, many of the Taiwanese people, they hire Indonesian and Filipino maids to come work with them. They're not slaves in that sense, but they're servants. They're, they're butlers and, wait, and, and, and maids. And one of the maids that came and help out, helped out at my grandmother's house to help out with my ailing grandfather, she came from Indonesia, and she would clean and she would cook. But after her cooking and after she would set the meal before the table, she would disappear, and we couldn't find her. And for the first while, we, couldn't real, we didn't know where she would go until we found out that every time she finished the meal, she would go out and she would eat on her own in her own room. And it took quite a bit of convincing before we could invite her to the table because she said, you know, we as maids, we don't eat with the masters. We're trained and we're taught to eat separately. And this kind of mentality was the same in the first century as it is now. And Paul says that this is the kind of two groups that come together to form a new community in the body of Christ. It's an impossible community. But Paul says that in the Spirit, it is made possible. This doesn't mean that every single church needs to have a representative from every culture of the world. People, the churches in Africa don't need to have white people in their church for them to be a God-abiding and a word-abiding church. That's not what this passage means. We as a Chinese church, as a first, as, as, when our parents came to Canada, they built this church for the purpose of congregating as Christians, and they met together as Chinese because the language required that they met like this. And today, we as a body of Christ, we, we meet together, not only as a body of Christ who speaks Chinese, but also as a group now who speaks English. And so what we need to ask ourselves, and it's a question that our parents didn't have to ask, is are we reflecting the richness and the diversity that should be in the body of Christ today? Today, as an English-speaking congregation in Montreal, in a multicultural city, we need to ask the question, are we reflecting the people of our society? Are we reflecting the richness that God desires for his body? 
We're not trying to be a multi-ethnic church for the sake of being all multi-ethnic. That's not what we're trying to do. But what we want to do is we want to display the richness of Christ in the body of Christ. And as an English-speaking church in Montreal, I think that God is calling us as a church to reach out not only to the Chinese people, but reach out to the Montrealers here, to the white and to the blacks. We as a church need to ask ourselves now as a second generation how we are living as a body of Christ and reflecting the richness of Christ. I think that as Chinese Christians born and raised in Montreal who speak English, French, and Chinese, God has given this church and our people a very specific and singular set of skills and tools and opportunities and resources for us to minister to the greater needs of this city. When Paul writes that the Jews and the Greeks and the slaves and the free are meeting together, God's vision for the church is a church that reaches out to every single stay as every single class of society. God's vision is of a church is where all ethnicities are gathering here and where our parents and where our ancestors could not fulfill this mission, we as second generation Christians, Chinese Christians who speak English, French, and Chinese, I think God has given us a spectacular amount of opportunities for us to fulfill this vision of the church. So we need to ask ourselves that question. Notice that in, in verse 13, Paul writes, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Paul says that everyone was baptized into this body. Everyone was made to drink of this spirit, meaning everyone was made to be filled with this spirit. This was a fulfillment of what Jesus said in John chapter 7. Let me read to you what Jesus said in chapter 7 of the Gospel of John. Jesus said, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus gave us the Spirit not just so that we as a group of Christians could be meeting together and being united together, but Jesus gave us this Spirit so that out of our hearts would flow rivers of living waters. And these rivers flow out, out of this church, through these four walls, into this city to meet the needs of those who are Jews and Greeks and Quebecers and Africans and Indians and Arabs. That's the gift of the Spirit and that's the purpose of the Spirit. Not just so that we could be strengthened as a church, but that the rivers of living water that flow out of our hearts would go and meet the needs of this city. That's what Paul means when he says that the Jews and the Greeks and the slaves and the free can meet together in one body. That's an amazing vision. We want as a church and we want Grace Church to have this kind of vision as we walk out into the streets. Don't waste the opportunity that God has given you. Don't waste the languages that God has given you. Don't waste the opportunities that God has given you to minister to the needs of this city. Out of your heart will flow rivers of living water so that this city would be revived. So number one, the body of Christ is an impossible community made possible by the Spirit. Number two, the body of Christ is united in its diversity and not in its uniformity. We saw this point last week, but we need to stress this point. The body of Christ is united in its diversity and not in its uniformity. I want you to think about this community of Jews, Greeks, slaves, and free for a second here. Think about it. When these Jews became a Christians, and when these Gentiles became a Christians and they met together in the church, did they immediately lose their Jewishness or lose their Greekness? No, right? 
As they came to the church and became Christians, they remained Jews who, who had their Jewish customs and their Jewish ways. And these Greeks, when they became Christians and entered into the body of Christ, they, they retained their Greek knowledge and their, uh, and their Greek logic and their way of living and their way of talking. And when these slaves and when these free people came together as, as Christians, did they immediately lose their status as slaves and free? No, they remained a slave. They remained free people. And you see now that when the body of Christ is brought together, we remain as we are. And God designed that so that his richness would be manifest in the diversity of people and cultures and statuses in the body of Christ. That's an amazing thing to see. When a slave comes to church, when a free man comes to church, he remains a slave and he remains a free man. And the reason these people can come together and gather is because there is a higher identity that, that dictates who they are. They are no longer just Canadians. They are no longer just Jewish or just Greek. They are no longer just Canadian or American. They are Christian. And because they are Christian, all of the things that surround them fade in comparison with their identity as a Christian. The, Christ, the body of Christ is not a melting pot. People co don't come into the church and lose their identities and lose their skills and lose their backgrounds and lose their, 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 their distinctiveness and become a big pot where everyone is kind of just melting together. That's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is like like a stew, like a properly cooked stew, where every single ingredient feeds into each other, but where every single ingredient remains intact. That's a good stew. You want a good stew to have the carrots affect the beef and the beef to affect the carrots. That's, a, that's what the body of Christ should look like. You don't lose who you are when you come into the body of Christ. And that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. The Indian person who comes to church brings with him the richness of his culture and God is manifest and glorified in his Indian culture. And when a Quebecer comes into the church, he brings with him his Quebec English and he brings with him his, his culture and his ways of life and God is glorified through that and that the body of Christ is made rich when these people come together. The beauty of the body of Christ is that individuals who are in the body of Christ don't find their value as individuals, but find their value as a whole. You know, we often say that the sum is greater than the whole of its parts. For the body of Christ, this is infinitely true. If you had a powerful hand, that hand would be totally useless without the body. If you had an amazingly sharp eyes, you had 20-20 vision, able to see like, an, like a falcon sees, those eyes would be useless without the body. But when you take a hand and when you take an arm and we take good eyes and you put, together, put those together into a body, then you can play baseball. And then you can hit home runs. And you can do amazing things because the sum of these parts together is greater than just the parts as a whole. And when John 15, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, we should also read into that, apart from the body of Christ, we can do nothing. That's amazing. I can do nothing apart from you. And you as Christians can do nothing apart from me. So the body of Christ is an impossible community that God has made possible through the Spirit. The body of Christ is united in its diversity, not in its uniformity. And that is the way that God had designed this church to work. But there are two things that hinder the body from properly functioning. There are two things that Paul mentioned in this passage that, that prevent this church from functioning as it is. I'll give them to you right at the beginning. Number one, the problem is of an identity crisis. And number two, it's a problem of delusions of grandeur. Okay, number one, the identity crisis. 
Paul writes in chapter, in verse 15 and 16, he says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. What Paul is describing here is for a member of the body of Christ to be in an identity crisis, to not know who he is, and to want to be something that he is not. The foot wants to be the hand, and the foot strives its hardest to behave and to act and to fulfill the things that the hand can do. And for its whole life, this foot desires to be this hand. And when he can't do it, he says, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body. And in the same way, the ear wants to become that eye. And the ear looks at the eye and looks at the gifts that the eye has. And its whole life, it strives to be able to see when it doesn't realize that the, for the whole time, God designed it so that this person would hear and not see. And this kind of identity crisis prevents the body of Christ from functioning because the foot was supposed to walk. The foot was supposed to bring the body of Christ to a new place. And instead of the foot becoming the, the, the means by which it can move, the foot instead says, no, I want to be the hand. I want to be the person that can be playing the piano. And therefore, I will not walk. I will play the piano. And by doing so, you prevent the body of Christ from moving. This kind of identity crisis is very prevalent, not just for not, not just in, in our, our church, but in every church. You hear people saying like, if only God would give me the gift that that person has. If only I could teach the Bible as he teaches the Bible. If, I, if only I could have the gift of prayer as this person prays. If only I had the, the mind to be able to digest the Bible and be able to, to teach it clearly. I remember as a youth, I wanted that. I wanted to be the smartest I wanted to be the greatest. I wanted to be the scholar and to be, able to, to be able to have high IQ and to be able to digest all of the things from this Bible and be able to, to teach it properly and clearly. But God meant it so that I would not be the smartest. God meant it so that there would be people who had the things that I did not have so that I and him can become one body so that we can complement each other so that we would not have the same gifts. In verse 18, God says, I arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as I chose. And this kind of identity crisis that prevents the body of Christ from functioning as it is, God says to these people who are feeling inferior to other people, who feel that they are not as good, not as spiritual, God says to you, I chose you. I chose you from out of your sin and out of your darkness and I placed you as a foot so that you would serve the body of Christ. I know you better than you know even yourself. I know you even better than your parents know you and I placed you as a foot in this church to serve in that capacity. Brothers and sisters, you may feel that you don't have the gifts of other people in this church. And because you, you might think that because of that, you are not worthy to serve. But this morning, God says to you through this passage that God chose you out of your sin and out of your darkness, and he chose you with the specific set of gifts, and he chose you with a specific set of backgrounds and talents that you have so that you can meet a specific need in this church that no one else can meet. You might not be able to sing like the worship team sings. You might not be able to preach like Dr. Purby preaches. You might not be able to, to serve and to do things that other people can do. But God says that there is a gift inside of you that you need to bring to the table because there is a specific function that you can, can do. And that gift is what God has given you so that you can meet a need in this church. So that's the first problem, identity crisis. But there's another problem that hinders a church from functioning pro properly, and that's having delusions of grandeur, having an illusion, uh, delusions that we are better than others. In verse 21, Paul writes, 
The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. What Paul is describing here is a member of the church being delusional because this person thinks that he is better than others, that he does not need others to function. And Paul says, you cannot say that because you as an eye, you cannot hold things in your hands. You as an eye, you cannot move. You as an eye, you cannot think. You can only see. And you need the other parts of the church for you to be whole, for you to function. As Christians, by definition, we are a needy people. We are a needy people. I know that the society doesn't like needy people. In fact, many of us probably don't like needy people. We don't like people who are needy and clingy, who, who, all, who all, often rely on other people. But you know that by definition, Christians are a needy people. We just sang the song, Lord, I need you. Every hour, I need you. By definition, as a Christian, you are a needy person. You need Christ. But God says here something even more. He says that not only do you need God, but you also need your brothers and your sisters. You need each other. I need you. You need me. So when we sing that song, Lord, I need you, every hour I need you, we should also be singing, Sam, I need you, every hour I need you. And that would not be blasphemous. That would not be against the Bible because here Paul is saying, you need your brother and your sister. We ought to say to each other, Kevin, I need you, or Gary, I need you, because there is something inside of me that I cannot fulfill unless you come and you serve me. There are parts of the church that, there are needs in this church that cannot be met unless we all come together and we serve each other with the gifts that God has given us. And this is something hard to swallow, that we need each other, that I need Sam, that Sam needs me. This is something hard to swallow because since we were young, we're taught to be autonomous people, right? We're taught to be independent, especially in North America. Teenagers want to be independent from their parents. People who are married want to be independent from their family. I know when I first got married, we want to be independent from our family saying, we don't need you. We want to support ourselves. A man wants to be independent from his wife thinking that I don't need my friends and I don't need you to come and support me. I'm the one who's supporting you. You need me, but I don't need you. But you know the Christian life is about being a needy person about admitting the needs that you have and asking for other people to come and meet your needs. That's what the Christian life is about. At the root of autonomy is actually a root of sin. Because when the, the word autonomy actually means self and law. Auto means self and namin means law, self-law. And there's a sense in which this is a good thing. You want someone to have God's law inside of them so that that person doesn't need another person to tell them what to do. That's a good thing. That's a good way of being autonomous. But in the same way, autonomy can be a terrible thing because autonomy can say, I want to decide what law is, is, is what I want to follow. I decide what law applies to me, and I decide which laws do not apply. And autonomy can also lead to someone saying, I don't need you to come and, and serve me. I'm fine on my own. And this is the kind of autonomy that led Adam and Eve to fall in the Garden of Eden. Because when the Satan came and tempted Eve and said, when you eat of this fruit, you will know good and evil. And this Eve and Adam, they ate of the fruit because they wanted to become autonomous from God, saying, I don't need you to tell me what is right and wrong. I want to be able to be the one who decides what is right and what is wrong. At the root of sin is actually a desire to be autonomous, to be without God and to be without each other. But the Christian life is a call for us to admit our need of God and to admit our need for each other. That is what we are by definition. 
But in verse 22 and 20 to 25, Paul says something even more striking. Paul says, not only do you need each other, but on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there, be, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. God designed it so that in the body of Christ, there will be people who seem strong, and there will be people who seem weak. God designed it that way. God designed it so that there are people who look to be very, 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 very important for the body of Christ and, there, and for their other people who seem useless. God designed it that way. And he designed it that way because every single part of the body has a strength and a weakness. And that is not always apparent on the surface of things. When we think of a body, we think the most important of the body, part of the body, we might think it's the eyes because the eyes make you see. No one wants to lose their eyes. But do you realize that your organs inside of you that are hidden are many times more important than your eyes? Would you rather have your eyes or would you rather have a heart? Would you rather be able to see or would you rather be alive? You know, on the surface of the church, it may seem as though it's the pastors and the elders and the teachers and the worship team leaders who are essential to the church. Without them, we can't have a worship service. But God is saying here that the unpresentable parts, that the parts of the part body that we think are less honorable are actually indispensable. There are some of you here today that have been serving the church for 20, 30 years who have never stepped here on top, on top to the stage. And God says you are indispensable to the church. Without these people in the church, the church would not be here today and yet we never see these people we never see their names on the bulletin but they are indispensable to the church i want to point one of these brothers out this morning you know there is a need in my life that has been met by one of the most unlikely people in this church in my family we don't celebrate birthdays because when my when we were kids my mom used to say why should we be celebrating your birthday when it was me that did all the work? So my parents, we never really celebrated birthdays. But you know that on every July 1st, my birthday, there is a brother in this church who without fail always gives me a birthday card. It's Gary, Gary Chin, right? Because he not only has ministered... <laughs> Not only has Gary ministered to me, but he's been giving cards to many, many people in this congregation. And there was a need in my life that God used Gary to fulfill in the unlikeliest of ways by remembering my birthday, by giving to me a card every single year. And God used him to come and meet my need. And this is the way the body of Christ works. There are parts of this body that seem weak. There are parts of this body that seem unpresentable, but in fact, they're indispensable. You know, when Paul speaks about these unpresentable parts of the body, he's referring to the sexual organs. The sexual organs are not something we present to the public. They're not something that we, what, that we flounder around for everyone to see, but they're an indispensable part of a human being to be able to pro procreate. They're an indispensable part for a couple to get intimate. And this is what Paul is saying here. There are parts of this body of Christ that will never be shown or will never stand on this stage, yet you are indispensable for our growth and you are indispensable for our health. Do you realize here that there's another thing that Paul is mentioning here? When Paul says that there are different parts of the body that the eye is not the foot and that the ear is not, is not, is not the head. 
He is also saying that God built into the body of Christ and into each of you certain strengths and certain weaknesses. But God designed it so that in this body of Christ, each of us have strengths and have weaknesses, and we need those strengths as well as those weaknesses. I am not good at administration. That is one of my weaknesses. But you see that Paul is saying here that my limitations as a poor administrator is actually part of the design of the body of Christ. How could that be, right? And the reason this is, is because my lack of administration is meant to be fulfilled and met by someone else's gifts for administration. That's how it works. The eye cannot move, and therefore the eye needs the feet to be able to move. And God built those limitations into you. God does not give a single Christian all the gifts because God didn't want that one Christian to be the church. He wants the entire body of Christ to have strengths and to have weaknesses so that we can fit together like these pieces in a puzzle so that we can become serving one another, caring for one another, and become united. So you as a limited Christian, when you admit your weaknesses, that is not admitting your failure. When you come to the body of Christ and admit, you admit your weaknesses and you, you admit your limitations, you are actually building up the church because you are allowing other people to see your weaknesses and allowing other people to meet those needs. That's a remarkable thing to do. Nowhere in society are we asked to boast of our weaknesses except in the body of Christ. This is the only place in the, in the whole world where you are asked to boast and to share and to identify your weaknesses so that another person can come and meet those weaknesses. That's an amazing thing, and God designed it that way. So we don't just need each other's strengths, we need each other's weaknesses so that we can be a part of each other's lives. That's why Paul says here, when one member suffers, others suffer, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. There's two ways of reading that verse. That verse can mean either number one, hey brother, you better pick up your slack because when you don't do your work, everybody suffers. That's one way of reading it. Another way of reading it is saying, brother, I know you suffer, but I want you to know that we suffer with you. We suffer together with you. And I think Paul means it the second way. He doesn't mean pick up your slack, brother, get working. He means, brother, we suffer together with you and when you are tired and when you are burdened, we are alongside with you to suffer with you. Because in chapter, in verse 25, Paul says that the members may have the same care for one another. God designed the body of Christ so that the weaknesses and the strengths are essential to the health of the church. Now, what does all this mean for us? What does all this mean for Grace Church? As Grace Church, we want to be a body of Christ where we can have an opportunity to share our strengths and to share our weaknesses. You cannot live the Christian life to its fullest just by coming here on a Sunday service and then going home afterwards. You need to have a place where you can share your life, share your burdens, share your weaknesses, and have those weaknesses met by someone else. And this is why... For, the, for this year and our theme to do life together, your elders and I were working to build small groups into this church. Small groups as for, for the health of the church is an integral part of how the body of Christ functions. You need to be part of a small group and you need to be part of a fellowship so that you can meet other people's weaknesses and that your weaknesses can be met by others. And so one of the things that we need you to pray for us as a church and pray for the elders and pray for us is to pray that our church would learn to live life together as small groups, in small groups. And one of the things we need to do is we need to either join a small group or we need to form a small group. 
If you are not a part of a small group right now, we encourage you to join one of the several groups that are currently going on here in this church. But I know that some of these groups are not meeting, cannot meet all the needs of this people. So if you see that there is a need for a new group, maybe it's time for you to pray and ask the Spirit to give you this gift of perhaps leading a new group, of perhaps starting a new group. This afternoon, the elders and I will be meeting to talk about how our church can restructure and reform our small groups in this church so that we can work together really as a body of Christ. We don't want anyone to be left behind. And I know many of us sitting here today, we've been coming to this church for many years, but we've never known what it means to live life in small groups. And we want you to experience that. Because that's the only way and that's the only means by which you can come to a fullness of Christ and understand him. So would you join me now in prayer as we pray that we would learn to live as a body of Christ. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have such a grand vision for the church. You have such a grand vision for the body of Christ. And this morning, Lord, we ask that you would give that vision, put that vision into our hearts so that as members of the body, we would recognize how crucial we are to each other. Help us say to each other that we need each other. Help us say to one another that I can't do life without you. And give the leaders of this church wisdom as we wonder and we ponder how we can be more, how we can live in small groups, how we can fulfill this vision more effectively in this church. We pray and we ask this in your son's name. Amen.